Hi everyone, I'm Jane Applegath and welcome to the Epic Vision Zone. Our goal with this show and company is to bring you trailblazing women from around the globe to share their ideas, their knowledge, resources, and inspiration to help you transform your dreams into epic success. Today's epic female entrepreneur is Dr. Susan Taffer, an academic architect who holds seven degrees and is the CEO of a new stealth ed tech company. Dr. Taffer is a renowned intercultural ambassador for universities and businesses, an educational ambassador for global peace initiatives, and the founder of World Connections Foundation, a nonprofit 5013C with a mission to redesign education to elevate the human potential for the 21st century and beyond. With over 27 years of experience in the educational field, Susan believes the time is now to recreate the education delivery system. Forging this groundbreaking path is, is what she sees as a new breed of teachers emerging as innovators, collaborators, and visionaries she calls the educational entrepreneurs, individuals she is leading. Her out-of-the-box thinking and multi-course knowledge as a global educator and speaker in doctoral studies and women's leadership have led her to the creation of revolutionary teacher training modules for the 21st century that will transform teachers into CEOs. Susan says, get ready, because the narrative of teachers' resistance to change and innovation is about to shift not by an outsider from Silicon Valley, but an insider ready to take th shake things up and take them to the next level. Welcome, Dr. Susan Taffer. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi, Jane. It's so funny that um, you shared with the story about um, uh, changing education from the inside. And thank you so much for bringing that up because that's what I'm about. And uh, it's always exciting to chat with you because you have exciting things to say and great questions. So I can't wait to uh, share what I've been thinking and let's start. Yeah, let's get started because this is an area that is so in the news these days and an area that is in for a big shift. There is no question we cannot stay where we are. So I want to start with your journey into the educational field. I have to say, I am so impressed. Wow, seven degrees. That is incredible. Mm -hmm. So tell us how you got to so fired up about obtaining so many degrees and ended up in the educational field. Thank you for asking. It was actually uh, something that I had always wanted to do and never was able to do because I was uh, not in an environment where education was well respected nor um, promoted. So I did like every other young woman and that was to get married and have a family. So I waited until I was an adult and uh, in my early 40s before I ever began to go back and pursue a formal education. By then I'd had a lot of experience in business marketing and managing and so I knew exactly how to maneuver a system and when I became engaged in coursework I figured out how to manage myself and my educational pathway so I could get the most out of my time and I was able to accomplish seven degrees in 10 years. Um, why? Because I knew I could. Why not? Uh, to me, education is an incredible journey and everybody that uh, starts out in life, uh, they start out as a learner because they've not done it before, right? And so what does that look like? It can look like many different things. Mine happened to be the academic arena because that's where I found myself and that's where um, I thrived. So I dove in and just kept moving until I reached a pinnacle and now I I look at this wall behind me and I say, I have my union cards that will get me in any arena. I need to have a chat with anyone. And so um, I don't have to worry about um, feeling it as though I'm uh, speaking from authority because um, there, if, if you want that, there it is. <laughs> I don't feel it's absolutely necessary, but there are many ways to learn. And that's what I'm, um, 
about right now is promoting opportunities to learn for everyone because everybody as i say we're all lifelong learners one way or another right absolutely and in fact that's what i was going to say is you're a lifelong learner like most of us these days and it's for me it's so exciting it, it feeds my soul to learn and it could be things that i didn't even know i was interested in like i guess you went from one degree to another so one led to another and speaking of innovation then uh, as an innovator in the education field, and who better to be immersed in that than someone who has been in it for over 27 years and had been through the system, as you said, where do you see education going? Mm, that's a really good question. I think there's a lot of unknowns, but what we do know is it cannot stay the same. And with that in mind, how many people are struggling to either get out of education or to um, perhaps think of a new way to do education so they themselves who are lifelong learners can become educators. And that's what I'm about, helping those people land and find themselves in an area where they can use their skills to teach others in many different ways. And it doesn't have to be in the formal educational system that we, we see going on now. So where can it be? And there are many ways of uh, teaching and learning and many ways to do it with integrity, but there's, um, a lot going on, right? Uh, a lot happening in any search engine you go on to or any business or industry you're in, there's a lot of people that are stepping up to the plate and they're wanting to teach and, and train others and that's really a good thing. But what better way to do that than to have sort of a platform where everybody can come together, promote their teaching styles and not have to be concerned about losing IP or perhaps not even uh, having as big an audience because people can share audiences. There are way too many people in the world to be concerned about whether or not I have enough to listen to me or whomever. Um, there's plenty to go around. As a matter of fact, the upcoming marketplace is going to be over 324 billion they anticipate in the upcoming year. That's the, how much money will be generated through education and some of that will be new models of education. Wow. Yes, those are huge numbers. And certainly yeah. it's it's time. I mean, there is no question that mm -hmm. the system has been around forever and that's the system that hasn't been changed. So method of teaching with impact. I'm an avid life learner, as I said before, as you are. And mm -hmm. most of our audience members are as well. That's why they're here. But mm -hmm. what method of teaching do you feel, having been in the field these all these years makes the greatest impact today because we are in a different place today than we were say even 10 years ago even five years ago well without getting too heady in theory i will share with you that education is designed for education to survive and for social reproduction how do we keep the system looking the same way that it looked 20 years ago. How do we teach our young people to manage and live in a world that we've created, right? Our world, our economy was all a construct. And so we're teaching our children, our kids, our young adults, our older adults, how to get along in that world. Well, uh, the world is topsy-turvy. It no longer exists. People now are going back to school, learning skills for jobs they don't even know what are yet. And so we are moving so fast in the field of technology that um, it's hard to predict. So when you consider what needs to be taught or how people need to be trained, one of the areas is how to promote their own um, creativity and how to engage in um, learning in a way that expands and they discover. And for every unique individual, it's a unique pathway. Um, I believe that every individual I ever have taught, worked with, um, they're geniuses in their own area, right? <laughs> There's some area in their life that they really got it going on and they know exactly what's happening. And so that is a sense of freedom to know that you can learn what you're good at, what feeds your soul, what you're passionate about. It's not as if that you can promise yourself that, I think the adage is do what you love and you'll make money. Well, that's changing now. Love what you do and you'll make money at it. Mm. Think about that. So, you know, at 14, I love, I love uh, lots of makeup, jeans, teddy bears, and lipstick. 
Uh, how how does that serve you when you're 18? How does it serve you when you're 20? I love music, lots of rock, lots of dance, lots of activity, but then at 32, I have a different mindset. So what I'm trying to convey here is that for individuals, it's, it's how you show up, right? And when you show up to whatever it is you're doing with a sensibility of creativity, you're bringing your gifts to that Thing, whatever it is, whatever it is you're learning, being trained in, or wanting to do. So we make choices all the time. And I know in my career, I've made many different career choices on where I was going, what I was going to do. So uh, to be trained is to learn to open up that little box of creativity that's inside of all of us and apply ourselves to that, whatever that is, and to love doing that. And that's what we teach. That's how we approach teaching. That's how we approach learning. And it really is a fascinating thing to watch people get excited about it. Suddenly somebody's talking their language because we're all striving to do that, right? In everything we do, we all are all striving to enjoy it, to get something out of it, whatever that is. <laughs> right. I love that. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You're because in the days of your before and even still today we are mm -hmm. pushed into uh, a box where society says you need to go and learn this and you need to go and learn that and it doesn't matter if it sings to your heart or if it's something that you're interested in it's what needs to be done because it's it's it and it happens still with the young people i have a girl a, a wonderful entrepreneur whose friends, very young, she's in her early 30s, and all her friends told her she was crazy not to go through with what she got her degree in, which was criminal justice, <laughs> but she <laughs> wanted to be an entrepreneur. And they said, you're not going to get a paycheck, you're going to be broke. And she said, I don't care. This is what I want to do. This is what I love to do. And she is rocking it now. She is mm -hmm. blowing away her friends in not only in her business but in her 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 confidence and now they're all coming to her so it's so interesting that you you say that because it really is happening today and it's wonderful that we do have some of these young people breaking out on their own but wouldn't it be great if it's instilled in the education system oh my gosh that would be and just think of how productive the world would be and how happy the world would be mm -hmm. so Taking that a step further, because we can learn mm -hmm. and get so much information now on Google, I have a question that I was thinking of because I often go to Google for information, why, how, mm -hmm. how to's, etc. And I wanted to get your opinion as an instructor, an, an instructor versus a Google teacher. So Mm -hmm. Many of the top coaches believe the knowledge is power today, and I believe that as mm -hmm. well. In fact, J Jim Quick is one of my favorite. He says, if knowledge is power, then learning is our superpower. I love that. So that being the case, what is the value difference between obtaining knowledge from an, 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 the internet and getting it from a coach and or an instructor like yourself? Mm -hmm. On the That's internet, very, very still making it. Yeah, still making it virtual, but working with an individual. Correct. And and you're so right, Jane. I love the question because it's a big question. Um, we can have access to just about any information. I was sharing a conversation earlier today with another professor from another institution, and I said, you know, pardon me for speaking about Harvard or Stanford or any of the other big ones, but when you think about university education, there isn't anything they teach that you can't find out anyway on the internet at some level. You can investigate and research and have access to the same information, but what you miss out on when you do that is one, what is good information, and two, um, the ability to be able to have that reflected in um, a, a one-to-one -one shared experience helps deepen the knowledge and validate the knowledge. So it's always good to uh, work with people who have um, experience in an area that can help pull that out of us because you can get it right here and that knowledge goes in, sifts through, and you can get that anywhere. You can get any knowledge anywhere, but have it deepen and come down into um, what I call an integration and then you can synthesize the information and apply it 
because it's the application that means so much. It's the application that makes life more exciting. And not only did I have this understanding, but I applied it and look what happened. Look what I created. Look what's happened. Other other people are benefiting. Other people are growing. Our, our sense of who we are, our social existence, our community, our uh, countries, and on and on. So it's a high value to work with someone individually. So um, how do you find that person? Well, you can go on and do it virtually, but um, <laughs> it's really an exploration of what resonates with you. And also the people that are in the field of coaching and expert training and uh, teaching, um, they've been there likely and done that, right? Right. So you can learn from their experience. What a great jewel from their experience and their knowledge. See, I, I don't believe that. I believe that knowledge is power, absolutely. But I don't believe it's necessarily owned. I believe that it becomes valuable when it's shared. And sharing knowledge is the key to expanding our humanity, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> sharing knowledge expands humanity. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, we, we definitely, it's, it's one of our core, at least for me, it's one of my core values, uh, not just learning, but sharing what we learn. And in fact, Tony Robbins ha and uh, Dean Graziosi have very succinctly coined it as knowledge brokers, because we mm -hmm. take that knowledge that we have learned, and then we are sharing it or brokering it to other individuals because how I interpret things and you interpret things are different in the way we see it, but that's what adds that, that meat, that juiciness to the knowledge, like you said, that interaction. And when you have an instructor, you become engaged, you discuss it, you unravel it, you unwrap it, you take it 10 ways to Sunday, <laughs> Because I've, I know you're some of your classes, and you've, you know, you we've talked some of the discussions that you've had, and they're fascinating. But that wouldn't happen if you were just taking a straight on course on the internet. There's no one to engage with. So yes, I love it. There is so much value in having a conversation, and not just with your instructor, but who that instructor also pulls in in the class environment, because then you have community, and then you have collaboration. So. Absolutely. I love that. It's, uh, there really is. A, and, and you brought in the fact that coaches are teachers as well, because as a coach, as an instructor, there's so m then that's a, an area that is just blowing up right now. So as those people, how can we, other than, than what you were saying, um, speaking and engaging people, how can we step up our game? You know, we need to step up into the role of mm -hmm. educational pioneers and leaders who imagine and create the future with a new vision rather than re reworking the old. I mean, that's basically how I see it. But in your words, how can we as coaches mm -hmm. and entrepreneurs step up our game so that we can share our knowledge? That's a really good question. Um, one of the things that I have found is uh, the trend in online delivery for education in the formal sense through universities and colleges has been to um, no longer have the sage on the stage who is the, the individual that has all knowing knowledge, right? But rather to become a facilitator of shared knowledge. And that is um, exactly what a coach does. So when a coach engages with um, groups of people or when you have um, uh, large volumes of people that are seeking information and knowledge on a how-to, um, one of the things that happens is there's a lot of learning that goes on in the facilitation of small group engagements. And the successful players such as Tony Robbins and people in that field, as well as yourself, you know that when you get um, groups of people together in small little um, clusters and they share uh, their experience of the knowledge that was just given to them, they find that they can apply it in many different ways and learn from each other. And so that has been um, key. And to continue doing that. The sage on the stage is, uh, you know, a thing of the past. The sage on the stage. I love that. I never, I, I yeah. love that, that uh, quote. That's fabulous. Yes, I understand. I mean, it's a boutique way of teaching so that you've got, you, you've got your audience there, but you're all one in the sense that you're all engaged in the same. And it's not this 
this, like you said, the sage on the stage where you have this massive audience of individuals, but there's no interaction with that one individual on stage because it's too big. So then it just becomes a direct uh, reading or a presentation and then they're gone and you're like, okay, that's nice, but I had some questions or what about this? So yes, that that's a really great way for us to step up our game is to come together, but in smaller groups. I think a lot of individuals are doing pods nowadays. So we can mm -hmm. do these teaching pods and that goes from everything, from coaching to education, to instruction, um, everything from working out to, you know, learning how to sew. I mean, and whatever you want to mm -hmm. learn, it's there. So education and technology, we've touched a little bit on the Google and, and you know, the, the caveat of basically having an instructor versus just the internet, but there is an advantage that technology is giving us today. So how do we embrace technology in the future of education? Well, first of all, we know that there are many different new technological advances being made on a daily basis. And um, in that process, we're creating new ways to communicate with each other as if they were in the same room with us. And I think this gives you one example. Um, we could be in the same studio or we could be in two different states, which we happen to be. And I know that you have um, other wonderful, amazing leaders on your program that have been in other countries. And I know that um, there are some setbacks occasionally, but overall it works in a divine way where we can communicate with each other as if we were next door. And can we share energy and ex uh, expressions and um, ideas and activities? Uh, maybe not the same as if we were in the same room, but it certainly works well to uh, open the doors. I am not a, a, the least bit afraid of where technology is going. And as a matter of fact, I think it's the key to our K through 12 problems is to educate and implement our kids, our young people on how to use technology in a very positive way. And, um, actually to, and some, I have worked with uh, doctoral learners who are creating uh, concepts and research on gamification of educational mm. models. So um, if you're having trouble learning math, what better way than to implement a technological platform that gives you little rewards every time you figure it out? Um, kids respond to that in a positive way. They're used to playing games. So think of the gamification of, of learning techniques in specific types of classes in those um, sort of what we call stacking levels of knowledge. So you, it's not as if you get this one piece of knowledge and it's all by itself and it means something. No, it's layers of knowledge that are built. Math is a good example of that. So you have to learn how to add and subtract before you can do, you know, advanced dividends, multiplications, things like that. So, you know, it's a little more technical probably than you wanted to, to know, but uh, one of the things that we're working on, and I can't reveal too much, is how to create um, a buffet of educational opportunities. So there's an average person that has a need for learning a specific skill, such as accounting and bookkeeping for small businesses, or the mechanics of working in a, an entrepreneurial startup in uh, the field of landscape maintenance, um, all the way to a CEO, executive leader, learning uh, leadership skills. Uh, how, do you, how do you go to one place and find all of that mm -hmm. and not have to worry about whether or not that organization or that institution is leading you through a degree pathway that you may or you may not need or you don't even want? And um, what we're creating is an opportunity to come and learn what you want, a buffet of opportunities, any level that suits your needs. And then maybe you want to shift and go over to um, learn something else in another area. Well, each of those has a value, right? And what we call, a, uh, we call them stackable degrees or stackable certifications where you get a little certificate for that completion of that bit of knowledge. You apply it in wherever you're needing to have the knowledge um, implemented and you come back for a little more. Well, suddenly after a couple of years of maybe one or two, three or four experiences, you realize that, well, you're not too far from maybe an associate's degree or you know, a, a specialized degree and those degrees are there for you and, and you can choose that. So what a great opportunity. You can either go for the gold and shoot for a degree level or you can get what you need at the moment in time that you need it. And 
what a what a great choice right and nobody's steering you one way or another can you imagine the realities of that and that's what's happened with our educational environment the higher education system has guided uh, learners to take specific degree pathways why there are seven of them <laughs> because it feeds them it feeds yeah. them now I had a reason for doing it beyond that so um, but I'm saying uh, they don't uh, bring you in the door and pat you on the head and oh just take whatever you want have you ever had that experience in formal education well imagine if you had the opportunity to just dial it up and say I want to take this yeah. and what if those training courses or that particular skill set had an interest by 17 different companies and they keep an eye on who completes those and they also contribute to that understanding in ways that you wouldn't have thought of what if you had that opportunity so you actually were engaged with the organizations that needed the 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 skill set anyway what we do in education is we try to convince businesses that academia knows the way to do it and that's just mm -hmm. completely the wrong way around <laughs> our yeah. businesses know how to do it we're trying to educate academia you know don't give me 10 graduates with you know an mba and they still don't know my company right <laughs> Makes wow sense? That totally that is such an eye-opener I love it and that is so what's happening I mean you've got first of all gamification mm -hmm. I have to tell you it's not just for the kids uh, challenges are so hot online right now for coaching programs for weight loss you name it challenges and that's just another way of gamification I mean that's what it is mm -hmm. it's gamification you have certain challenges that you provide an individual on a daily basis, they have to go and do it, and the person who, they come back the next day, and the person who uh, gets the prize of that day is the one who did it the best, or you know whatever that might be. So that's for adults as well, because it feeds that dopamine, but what it does is it pushes us outside of our comfort zone. I mean, I've participated in some, never done a Facebook Live, and I'm like, okay, I have to do this if I want to win that Peloton. I still don't have the Peloton, but I did it. And that's the point. That's the, that's the thing that you're getting people to do is actually to take action. So the gamification gets individuals to take action, whether they be old or young. And the stacking certifications are incredible because you're right. If you take a certification and you think, I really love this. I think I can run with this one then you can use that and run with it. But you think, hmm, that really opened the door for me. I think I want to learn more. But in this area, you can go and pick and choose. And, you know, like you said, corporations today are looking for individuals who are not in a box. They're looking for people who have that critical thinking. And what better way to gain your critical thinking than to go and take different courses that sing to you, not that dictate, well, we need your money. So therefore you need to take this entire course so that we get our money and half of them you're not gonna use, but we're not gonna tell you that because if you want the degree, that's what you gotta do. So I love it, Susan, True. oh my gosh, so powerful. So I love the fact that we're embracing technology in all those areas. Now, teachers becoming CEOs, this is something that is on the cusp and it is happening, but I think it's going to happen even in a bigger way. And this is where you come into play. So going from employee to entrepreneur can be a scary proposition for anyone, but as particularly teachers who come from sometimes a very uh, staid, a very old type of environment, um, you know, and those that are involved in the unions, I mean, we don't even want to go there. But what would motivate a teacher to take the leap to going from all that security and how can you help them prepare to get them there? Very honest and sincere question. I love it. Uh, that is really a tough thing for educators who have been um, working very hard to achieve their education then to also be in the classroom and uh, their passion is i don't know too many teachers that are there because the money's so great right generally it's because they have a lot of passion about being an educator and when they do it's it's 
a, a great inspiration for the first year or two, maybe even three, and, and some of them hang on with that passion up until 10 years. But what keeps them there for the long term are what we call the golden handcuffs. And what happens is, is because the uh, field that they're in is so inspiring for them personally, um, they don't really think or plan about the uh, financial benefits. And pretty soon that golden handcuff of a soon you will retire and your job's never going to go away and teachers are always in high demand but they're never paid very much. I, I, I can't say that, that that happens anywhere that they're highly paid. However, there is a way out and because the education system is changing and what it's going to help drive that is educators themselves because if you're no longer willing to look to that future golden handcuff era where you can walk away with a retirement and uh, whatever it is that you want to do or if you have a side hustle maybe that's sort of keeping you afloat what if you turned all that activity into a a business of being a freelance educator. Now, when you think of the term freelance, that means that tomorrow I don't have a paycheck. Well, that's not really true because the way things are so rapidly changing to um, deliverables online and educators are the absolute best for that. So if they can imagine taking themselves out of the classroom and into a technological platform to begin with, and then learn those skills and then expand on who they deliver to and then expand on what it is they're teaching and they focus only on the things that they feel are valuable important and they teach what they want the people to know who come to them they teach what they feel is valuable imagine that teaching only that that is valuable to what you want to share in the world mm. what a great experience to go from having to teach what you're told you have to teach and waiting for the day when you get to be free to actually creating that freedom today, tomorrow, the next day, by strictly the first step of learning those technological skills. Now, how can I say that so freely? Um, most of my learners, I would say probably, I would say 35% of my learners are in the classroom because I work in the educational uh, uh, doctoral training uh, session and that's from all over the world. I have educators that are looking to become principals. None of them are looking to become entrepreneurs. What a waste of energy. <laughs> so I actually do teach them. Well, you know, if you actually got out of the system and did exactly what you are capable of doing and used all these skills in a different way, what would that do for you? So that is one thing that um, we are uh, and I will I will gladly share information on how to um, engage in our curriculum, but we actually teach teachers how to teach online and how that can look for them. And at any age range, so it doesn't matter if you're a high school teacher or if you're a grade school teacher, um, doesn't matter if you're a college professor or university professor. And what will happen in the future, and I predict this, and I'm, I'm pretty strongly uh, aware that uh, it, it's a heavy duty kind of statement, but I'm, I'm not worried about it. <laughs> what will happen is educators will be their own agents and they no longer will be owned by a university. They will be able to teach their area of expertise and they will be able to teach it to whomever shows up online and they will make 10 times the amount of money as they will if they stay with the university. Because you have to realize that university professors become researchers for the university and the university has partnerships and those partnerships are feeding the uh, professor's research uh, directions. So you really govern there too. And um, if, if all of that became topsy-turvy, and it's already being super challenged. Um, I will say this, uh, uh, of the figure that I just mentioned, $324 billion in the upcoming year for, that is not formal education through universities. That is the money that's going to be in the field of entrepreneurial education. So wow. just keep that in mind. <laughs> Less so money is going to be going wagon. to the jump on the bandwagon get a port i mean do you know that's a lot of money that you could just you know take a sliver of and if you become an expertise now imagine as a learner you and i we have this interest and we want to learn how to what if we wanted to learn how to code and there's some really great technology that's speaking about um 
um, uh, multidimensional figures in the in an environment of um, education or even anywhere on lectures or business uh, communication or lab techniques uh, lab techniques or um, how to create your own financial institution so we wanted to go to a the, one of the best institutions where we could learn. We don't have to go. We go to the one person that teaches at the best, right? And you're where you are. I'm where I am. And we can talk to people in Paris. We can talk to people in Italy. We can talk to people in Korea in the same classroom as if they were right in the room next door. And we're already doing that. So what if that was our um, educational pathway and we got to design our own bachelor's degree in um, coding for global marketplace and learn from the best. I mean, could you imagine how much fun that would be? I find it exhilarating. <laughs> yeah, well, because here's the thing too, when you, you think of it on a human level, we, the, the instructor or the coach or the teacher, however you wanna call them, is in alignment with what resonates with them. And when, an individual is in alignment with their core values, with the ob or the subjects that they interest them. That gift is exponentially uh, inspiring because they're they're talking a language that speaks not just to them, but it is projected onto their students. It makes total sense. I mean, it's you, you know you're taking not just the box away but you're, you're, you're expanding and you're allowing that individual to grow as they instruct. So I, I can see it, it's just so powerful. And yes, who wouldn't as a, as a teacher, because you're right, the salaries are not that great, but they do it because it's something that they, they felt called to, to do. And, and mm -hmm. that's, you know, that, that comes from wanting to help individuals grow. Uh, but it becomes very disillusioning because they, you get, like you said, it's political. It gets caught up in, um, you know, the, the, the framework of what they dictate for you to tell, to teach. To, in fact, I remember, I'll just tell a quick story here that when I was in high school, I had an incredible history teacher and it was ancient history. We talked about all of the Egyptians and, and she would go off on stories about these individuals, but they were all the romantic stories that how each person was sleeping with the other. And it was fascinating. I mean, it was like a mini series, but we learned while she was telling these stories, which were actually true. Well, she got fired because she was teaching oh, sure. outside the box. And I was, mm -hmm. she was the, she was the most popular teacher in high school at that time. And I was, everybody was so disappointed, but they didn't care. I mean, they weren't, she mm -hmm. wasn't conforming to the institution. And mm -hmm. I was like, well, who cares? We're all learning. But yeah, I understand completely <laughs> what you mean. So educate. Mm -hmm. uh, so this actually segues right into our next, our next question, education and creativity. And we touched a little bit on that, but how does creativity play a role in the next phase of education and why is that so vital for the 21st century? A great, great question. I always defer to Sir Ken Robinson. And if you haven't seen his video, uh, Our Schools Killing Creativity. And it was one of the first TED Talks that actually put TED Talks on the map. And Sir Ken Robinson has since passed on, but his first lecture on that at the uh, University TED Talk was amazing. So do look it up. It's um, uh, very easy to find. It actually pops up the first one because it's been viewed by millions and millions of people. Creativity is absolutely essential. It always has been. Uh, look what's happened without it. When we're in an environment where we're taught only rote information, uh, we don't grow as individuals. It's, li it's like um, putting dry soil on a plant that needs water. You got, you got to let the, f the, the information flow. You have to be able to uh, experiment with the knowledge. And it doesn't mean that uh, there aren't right and wrong answers to certain things by all means that's that's true but individuals learn through stories individuals learn so much by hearing something they can relate to and then how do they apply it to their own lives you and i could sit around and talk about one plus one is two two plus two is four but if we talk about 
You know, when I went to the store, I actually needed to buy uh, two different things because I had to share it with my family and my brother and sister, and, and we only had enough money to buy two, but there were three of us. So how did we do that? Well, we went home. You know, so you begin to buy into the story that we can relate to. It makes sense, right? We can apply it that way. And so people learn through stories. People learn through create creative ways of, of sharing information. And, um, you know, we sit in meditation and imagine the amount of creative energy that moves around us when we're in a, a, a meditative state. You know, the world is about energy and knowledge is about energy because knowledge without any, uh, what do I want to say? It, it, if it's in a vacuum, <laughs> where does it go, right? Knowledge is energy. And energy is community, sharing it, experiencing it with others. And so creativity is absolutely important. And um, I think it's the essence of how people learn anyway. So, Yes, you're right. The, the, uh, when you look at one of the, actually the top qualification today for a lot of large corporations is not the degree, it's the critical thinking skills. And the critical mm -hmm. thinking is, it, the root of it is creativity because mm -hmm. we can't look at things the way we've been looking at them for the last, de for decades because the world has changed. And what we need to move forward in that change is thinking without the box. And that requires creativity, imagination. You know, they always say to, to imagine where you want to be three years from now, five years from now. Imagine, uh, uh, this is going to go right into our women's leadership because I love it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, imagine who you are within the context of archetypes because I know that that's a passion of yours. But why do we do that? Mm -hmm. Because it instills in us a sense of power or confidence or whatever it is or grace or or spirituality whatever it is that we can associate because that is so powerful so when you take that and put it into a business format or put it into your own business or share it with an individual it gets exciting it's it's the it's mm -hmm. the what do you call it um you want to brainstorm so that's i mean mm -hmm. you and i have done that where we just start putting stuff yeah. up on the wall and no idea is a bad idea i mean that's what brainstorming is right it's no mm -hmm. idea is Absolutely. a bad idea, even if it's outrageous, you know, it's, 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 but you put it up there anyway, because you never know where that might lead to another one. So, and that's mm -hmm. exciting that there's the energy right there. And then you bring in all the other elements. So yeah, I completely agree with you. And speaking of that, I would love you to talk about women's leadership and in the educational role, but also because we're here on the Epic Female Entrepreneur how that all plays into what we're doing here and why it's it's um you brought it to another level so i'll just give you the floor <laughs> thank you well more than a professor i'm also a leader in women's uh education and women's leadership training and i have uh worked with women all over the world and helping them advance in their careers or making changes in their career. Most recently, I worked with Women in Technology and it was a global organization that um, women working in a male-dominated role uh, and how to um, excel and become leaders within their organizations and great headway, great insights, absolutely a platform for discussion under some of the more challenging set of circumstances. But one of the things that has become very predominant in the discussion of leadership, and particularly among women who are seeking leadership roles, is the concept of authenticity. And we've heard a lot about it. And um, I, I'm giving a, a new little spin on the discovery of authenticity. One thing is I don't think that it is something you can strive for and become. I think every day we live our lives, we try best to be authentic. And I think everybody basically is authentic. But one of the ways to become truly authentic is to recognize um, where you're being inauthentic. And then you can really uncover and discover in yourself what needs um, nurturing, what needs a light. 
because we all carry some of um, our shadows, some of our experiences, some of our own limitations. I think the glass ceiling exists um, through culture and society for women, without a doubt. But I also think women in particular, as do men, uh, create their own glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. And we create it within ourselves because we refuse to look at what needs to be addressed or we cover it up or a lot of uh, effort has been made in um, spirituality in leadership training modules. And it's absolutely a wonderful component. But if we do spiritual bypassing, what have we done? We fail to look at what needs to be looked at because always the darkness without the, the light will permeate the darkness, um, but we have to shine it, right? We have to get awareness of it. So in leadership training is never, uh, or it almost is never at a certain level, especially the ones that, that we work with in the C-suite in different areas, that um, it's no longer about a skill. We've, we've got the skills. Uh, women have that. It's the ability to be able to look at themselves and say, how am I holding myself back? And what glass ceiling am I creating for myself? And that's the kinds of things I love helping uh, women leaders discover about themselves. And it's not about pointing fingers. It's about their own awareness. They, the light goes on. Half the time when I facilitate educational leadership training modules for women, I don't even know what their glass ceiling is. I just set the stage for discovery. And then that opens up the door for their own uh, learning. And that's the important piece. So um, women are now more than ever. Um, last year with the pandemic, we were held back because of family issues, having to take care and be a teacher at home. Many women stopped their careers. Um, and sometimes some didn't. Some weren't afforded the opportunity to stop their career. And dads were involved too. But you know, they had to be CEO of family and teacher and be a job, um, yeah. uh, wait until their job opened up sometimes, right? So uh, everything has just shifted and women were hit harder. Um, not that men weren't hit as well, but women were hit by numbers more than any other situation in the job market. So they step back and now women are coming back to the forefront. So what do we need to be? We need to be leaders. And bringing the feminine aspect to leadership by what I just discovered and shared with you, that creativity is fundamental. The ability to pivot, the ability to uh, uh, look at things in a different way. And it's not about I win, you lose. It's about we look at what possibilities are and how can we all benefit from it as a group as individuals so it's not that hard uh, let me put it this way the concept is not that hard to understand the application is much more difficult because we're used to doing things in a different way right yeah i love that the concept is not hard to understand it's the application that mm -hmm. is so on point because we can talk about leadership till the cows come home. So there's the concept and we can, you know, word it and move it around and shift it here and there, but it's taking that action, taking that leadership. And it all starts with you. This is what I've learned throughout my years. When I thought of leadership, I always pictured an individual who was leading a group or leading a company or they were the leader. But leadership starts with within us first, because once we learn or once we apply ourselves to the leadership of our own lives, that's when we can lead others. And I, the, you talked about inauthentic and authentic. And there's so much online right now and, and in the media about the imposter syndrome. And mm -hmm. I think that's the root of it. Just hearing what you were saying, that that is one of the roots of the imposter syndrome. Would you agree? Oh, definitely. We all suffer from it, right? We all mm -hmm. have times where um, I'm not sure I should be here. I don't deserve to be here. Or I'm not sure I have enough knowledge to to perform in this and right. it seems to be um, 
we all suffer from it, it seems to be harder for women to overcome. We yes. haven't had the practice. We, we just haven't had the practice. I think that's all we need is just a little more practice at that. And um, um, we are definitely changing things up, changing things around. And I used, to, I, I always share the story. I used to, in my early careers, walk into a boardroom and be very um, attentive to the dynamics of the room so I could understand how things were, were managed and what the language was. And most often the boardrooms were male or one or two female here and there. Um, I have a totally different attitude now. When I walk into a boardroom, I begin right away educating the people in the room about my own language. And guess what? They, they get excited about it. it. You know, so it really has a whole different way of, you know, coming to the table. And I, I think that's what women need to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another thing I want to share with you as well is, um, you know, uh, we as leaders come in many different layers of uh, application and showing up. And so I don't want uh, this conversation to be strictly about a CEO level person who considers himself a leader. As we're talking, we're talking about uh, classroom teachers that can become the CEO of their own company because they become their own agents of their own teaching, right? And how they show up in the marketplace. But uh, let's say somebody who works at a community uh, uh, center and they're doing great work there. Um, they're a leader where they are. And I just want to share that, that everybody in an organization leads. We all lead wherever we are. It's how we show up in that place. If a person is very, very comfortable in that place, that's important. And uh, I think I shared with you one last story about the orchestra, the metaphor for the orchestra that was um, uh, shared on one of our uh, conferences and um, that the orchestra in the beginning never had a conductor. Uh, people would show up, play their instruments and they would make beautiful music, but the concept of a conductor uh, came into the field and they were given a, a wand and um, in the beginning, the orchestra members were like, who's that person? Like, take your stick and go home, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then the concept of a conductor leading the orchestra became so much more accepted and beautiful music was uh, created from that relationship between conductor and um, the orchestra. And most recently, as the story was told in our organization, um, in one performance, the conductor became very ill and began to uh, try to continue but had to slowly sit down and the orchestra kept playing without him happened to have been a male and the orchestra just continued and they played the beautiful music as if he were there because he had all he had trained them everything was going smoothly and it reached a point in the crescendo of the performance where the orchestra then began to will him back up and to be well. And in the end of the program, of course, he was able to stand and complete the performance. And, and the metaphor is, you know, if, if you have to sit down and take a back seat, it's okay. The, the orchestra will continue to play. So um, anywhere in the orchestra, we're leaders and even the conductor can take a back seat and we'll move forward. So that's what I like to see. That's what I like to lead by. So Jane, thank you so much for such a great conversation that. today. That, I, <laughs> that's a beautiful story. And the orchestra continued because of his leadership. That's why. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate all of your insights and being here today and susan i wanted you to share your free offer with our audience and i encourage everyone to take advantage of this so just let them know what that is one free hour of conversation on zoom uh Pick your topic if you're thinking about going back to school, if you're an educator and you want to learn how uh, you can manage your own career as an entrepreneur. Um, either way, give me a shout out in the email and uh, we'll set up a conference call and um, I'll, I'll walk you through some steps. That is so generous. Oh my gosh. I hope everyone takes advantage of these offers because they are to the moon and back. I mean, there's no reason for people not to jump in and take advantage and get to know these incredible ladies. 
So uh, once again, all of that information and all of Susan's links and her social media will be in the summit directory, uh, including the offer. So you can get everything that you need there at your fingertips. And once again, Susan, thank you so much for being here and sharing your time and your knowledge with our audience. And be sure to follow me on Instagram at janeapplegath.com, or excuse me, at janeapplegath, I got ahead of myself. And check out how you can become an epic entrepreneur at janeapplegath.com. This is the Epic Vision Zone, transforming your dreams into epic success. Congratulations for signing up for the Female Entrepreneur Revolution. We're bringing you some of the most exciting female entrepreneurs from around the globe to share with you their knowledge, their ideas, their inspiration, and more importantly, their resources to elevate you to prosperity and freedom. And by being here, you're on the cusp of something great, your epic future. I'm Jane Applegath, founder of the Epic Vision Zone and producer of the Female Entrepreneur Revolution. Be sure to get your VIP pass and join me after the summit on June 16th for a very special VIP coaching session where we'll have hot seating, summit Q&A, and a special guest appearance by one of our speakers just for you, where we'll ignite your vision, up-level your confidence, and set you on the path to your dream's epic success. This is your opportunity calling. It's time to take action. Get your VIP pass now. I can't wait to see you on the other side.